Chaser Report is recorded on Gadigal land. Striving for mediocrity in a world of excellence, this is The Chaser Report. Hello and welcome to The Chaser Report with Dom and Charles. And today we have with us a wonderful old friend, old, old, old friend, Andrew Hanson. We don't know him very well, but he's very old. Hello, Andrew Hanson. Well, hello. I mean, I I feel like I'm probably a similar age to the people who host this (laughs) podcast normally. eh? Yes, old. I can neither confirm or or deny. But, Andrew, you're you're here not for a social catch-up. You're here to plug some of your fine, fine work. (laughs) And you, you managed to get a TV series up, which is a fantastic and slightly surprising thing. Congratulations. But it's very hard to do, I discovered. Yes, it's, it's mm. not, not easy to get one of those things these days. I've always said the world needs more TV shows from white middle-aged men. So, well, congratulations. Yeah, I, look, it does. And I've tried my best to supply, <laughs> you know, an, to, to, to contribute to the oversupply of TV shows by creating another one with Chris Taylor, <laughs> or, or at least writing another one. I mean, you know, we, we've sort of tried to take on various duties in this thing called Australian Epic. It's a, it's a musical slash documentary slash comedy sort of mashup show. So it's kind of true. It's, it's about true Australian stories that are very well-known stories. But they're retold in a in a fun and silly and satirical musical way. Uh, so if you've ever wanted, for example, to see the story of, say, Chappelle Corby or Stephen Bradbury, the, the ice skater who won a gold medal because everybody else in his race fell over, if you've wanted to see those stories done, you know, with a combination of the real Stephen Bradbury telling the story plus me pretending to be Stephen Bradbury and singing very silly songs on an ice rink, then... <laughs> Australian Epic is the show for you. We'll listen to some clips and hear more about this adventure in just a moment. So, yes, Andrew, I mean, if they're in the unlikely event that there are any fans of the war still around in this uh, wide brown land of ours, they might remember, you know, some of the musical items you did for, for that show and others, but then also if life were a musical, which was always such a fun segment because it meant, you know, you kind of brought that Busby Berkeley showbiz thing into into unexpected spaces. So it seems as though you've essentially expanded this into a an entire series. What an extraordinary thing. Yeah, it was something, I, I, yeah, because Chris and I kind of wanted to eventually write a longer, meatier musical thing and we dithered around and spent many years not doing that and then spent many years actually doing it because the, the uh, show took about five years to make because we wanted to, yeah, tell a full story rather than just write, you know, one silly song like that segment that you mentioned, If Life Were a Musical, which involved you know, us bursting into song in public places, in inappropriate places. I mean, while that was kind of amusing, and and then I think shortly after that, people started doing the same thing on YouTube and TikTok, so we were no longer the only people doing it. We thought, oh, we'd better better actually write a show full of songs. And so that's kind of how it it ended up happening. Although, you know, then you've also got the, the true parts of the show as well. And luckily, Chris, you know, he used to be a journalist. So he has this sort of journalistic chops and he was very good at doing the research. We also had some brilliant actual journalists doing the research on the show too. People like Sasha Payne and Greg Muller from ABC who dug up all this interesting new information about oh, some wow. of these stories. I was not expecting the interview to go in this direction, Andrew. I didn't think we'd have A, journalism and B, original research that unearthed some stories. That's great. Well, yeah, because they're, they're historical stories. So, you know, this Australian epic tells six stories. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, it's Chappelle Corby, you've got Stephen Bradbury. We've got the story of Johnny Depp's annoying Hollywood dogs, Pistol and Boo, who skipped the queue and tried to get through quarantine until Barnaby Joyce booted them out of the country. We've turned that into a musical. That was always destined, wasn't it? That was always destined to... Oh, it had musical written all over it, especially when she had Barnaby and a pair of dogs. And um, (laughs) we found some brilliant puppeteers to to operate these very cute, fluffy dog puppets who... Who, uh, who in the show are voiced by some of the music theatre stars. Uh, Phoenix, Jackson, Mendoza and Sammy Afuni are the voices of the of the two dogs. Did you have to be historically accurate, though? Could, can you have them being executed? Because I think we were all sad that the ending of that story didn't go the way we wanted. <laughs> well, well, I think everybody ended up wanting Johnny Depp to be executed, really. <laughs> oh, that but, too. That came a year or two no. later, I think. <laughs> yeah, the show goes into some flights of fancy sometimes in the musical numbers. But the documentary stuff is very straight and serious, so it's very very much like watching Foreign Correspondent or Four Oh, Corners thank goodness. Or something. Thank you goodness know. there's some more seriousness at 9pm on a Wednesday night in the ABC <laughs> comedy slot. That's great. <laughs> well, but, but that, you, you know, that's why, the, that's why the musical numbers work, because it's, mm, it's, it's the juxtaposition context. of the two. You know, yeah, so no, you go from, 
you go from these very straight interviews into a silly musical number and that's kind of what makes it interesting. I must say, I think it's a genius format, though, because you're sort of combining, yeah, the silliness of that if life was a musical type thing and the sort of hilarity with the ratings juggernaut that is Australian story. (laughs) So you, <laughs> that's probably yeah, you basically it's you got just, both ingredients. You um, basically you know. it's an ABC programmer's <laughs> wet it dream. Is. It's the most ABC program ever devised. That's that's a wonderful <laughs> thing. It's very um, very ABC. I mean I mean it's you know there are other historical musical comedy shows too. You know we're not one of the only people doing this. I mean Michelle Brazier keeps saying it's like it's like uh, drunk history, but. Sung, you know, which I guess it's that's a twist, to, yeah, because she's in it. I mean, the reason she's talking about it is she's in the cast. You have got a very eminent and impressive cast around you, um, Andrew. I must say, as you said, musical theatre uh, legends, you've got some chops yourself. But can you confirm or deny a thing I heard, which is that Christopher Thornton Taylor sings in this show? Is that is what? that really a thing? Oh, is that really a thing is happening? You check out the trailer or the or even actually, you can hear him right now if you if you. Um, stream the soundtrack album, which is out. The the Australian epic original cast recording is available now on Spotify and Apple Music, etc., etc. It's even on Deezer. Now, I always dreamed of having an album on Deezer. <laughs> Congratulations. <Yes. laughs> The French, the French one. <laughs> and you can hear, you can hear Christopher Thornton Taylor singing some lead vocals. He plays uh, among, he plays a couple of roles. He's not, he's not central to the cast, but he couldn't help himself. You know, he cast himself as an SAS drill sergeant in the story about the Tampa affair. Oh, I was so hoping there was a Ben Robert Smith episode, series two, series oh, two, series two, <laughs> maybe that one. Oh, that's heavy. <laughs> I think we tried to only tell stories that have happy endings. Uh, well, that, I don't that, know if that, that does. That did for the justice system, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, fair enough. It must have been hard to pick six, though. Only six stories. Yeah, they had to be the right shape, the stories, for, for a musical. So we had to, you know, there are so many great Australian historical stories. We considered some, like the invention of the dual flush toilet, for example. <laughs> That's an Australian piece of history. We thought that would Yeah, I've only got half fun. an hour to play with that, you? Well, I know you got half an hour. That's right. That would have been, been a six-hour production <laughs> just on its own, I think. So we sort of thought, what stories have a three-act structure? What stories have a happy ending? And, and also, you know, c- can you think of six or seven songs that they could be broken up into is the ah, other yes. challenge. So like with Chappelle Corby, it's kind of made for songs because you've got the opening number, which is called Barley High, and that's Chappelle and her friends planning the most bogan holiday <laughs> you could ever imagine. <laughs> to Bali and then they get there and she's caught by the customs officers at the airport and, and they sing a song called the Boogie Woogie Doobie Board which is when they find this huge bag of hash in her boogie board thing. then you've got the song You Picked the Wrong Crime which is sung by the Indonesian judge in the courtroom and um, in, in fact look actually I can roll out a bit of that song for you now do you want to hear a bit of You Picked the Wrong Crime yeah that'd be fantastic alright this is the judge and the prosecutors all singing at Poor old Chappelle, who tries to defend herself by comparing herself to Joan of Arc. I could have sentenced you to death So you kind of go up lightly <laughs> Oh, wow so a, that, That's a little snippet of one of the tunes it, it just lends itself to being told in the form of It certainly of does uh, Please tell me, because I know Chris was enormously uh, In fact, both of you are enormously interested in this Please tell me Paris Hopman, who to pee takes a uh, takes a role. Oh yeah, point. well that's the song. Oh, After you pick goodness. the wrong crime, we've got a song called "He's the Hot Man." Oh good. <laughs> and Sammy Afuni, who was in Hamilton, the Australian production, uh, he plays Hot Man, and it was the most Incredible. fought over role in the whole series. Actually, I bet everybody wanted to be Hot Man Paris Hutapaya, the the celebrity lawyer who wears bling and drives sports cars, who defended Chappelle Corby for a while until he just gave up and <laughs> left her in the lurch. Um, so Sammy Afuni, yeah, tears up the disco dance floor on He's the Hot Man with Amy Palmer who plays Chappelle. Uh, so the, he's got a disco number. Can I man. ask, Andrew, because I've always 
want want to know the answer to this. And I know you've done a research, a lot of research. You said you had Chris Taylor's journalism background and a, a dedicated research team uh, looking at these stories and un- uncovering new information. Did she do it? Did uh, you, uh, well, look, I don't want to give spoilers. I don't want because our research didn't uncover a definitive answer on that. I mean, the right. Indonesian justice system ruled that she was guilty, but there are different views expressed by the the people who we interview on the show about that. Um, we get to hear what one of her lawyers thinks. Um, we interview him, Erwin Siragar. We've interviewed Alexander Downer on the show because he <laughs> has not. Very central. Oh, of course, in fishnets. He would have been up for a he bit didn't, of We did ask bit him of show if he could put them on for the... But, but then it was only the interviews were only shot from the head up. And so even though oh, he was okay. quite willing to wear them, <laughs> unfortunately they're out of frame. Uh, it's a shame. But, <laughs> <laughs> so he, he gives his... I mean, that's one of the interesting new bits of information in the Chappelle episode is Alexander Downer because it's so much later now... Mm. He's allowed to say what he really thinks and whether she's guilty or not, and that's in there. Fabulous. But I, I don't want to spoil it for you. Uh, what's the one that's on this week? What's episode one? Yeah, ep one is is Bradbury doing a Bradbury. It's the story of Stephen Bradbury. I mean, it, it was an interesting discussion. You know, our ideal episode one was actually Chappelle Corby. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the ABC executives had a preferred order of the episodes, and we just had <laughs> wow. to agree to whatever they thought. What was the best order? So Bradbury's going to be... Oh, look, they're all good stories, I think. I, I, I think we're all happy with all of them anyway, so it doesn't really matter what order. But, it, but if you want to, you know, because it's a binge release on iView. So if you want to be cheeky and if you want to watch the series, I'll, just, I'll give you this. This is just a Chaser Report exclusive here. The writer's and the director's preferred episode order is Chappelle Corby first and then Pistol and Boo and then Stephen Bradbury third and fourth is the story of Melbourne's disastrous Ferris wheel the building of, of that <laughs> oh, was yeah. just so catastrophically <laughs> comical it kept <clears throat> falling over and cracking in the heat and it took years and years and years it sat there you know it had to be pulled down and rebuilt so we turned that into a musical that is definitely going to be my number one that's going to be the one I watch first when I heard you were doing that story that is the best story ever. That is the most Australian story ever told. Yeah, and then fifth, Princess Mary of Tasmania. Ah, beautiful. uh, Who married, you know, the ordinary woman from Hobart, married a Danish prince. That's our love story, the fairy tale romance story. And it's a g- we, it gave us the chance to satirise kind of what Australia feels about the royal family, you know, so the, mm. so the, the com- sort of the satirical edge in that episode, I guess, is why are we so obsessed with these bloody princes and princesses? And then the last episode is The Tampa, which is a dark left turn, and it's a much more emotional, meaty story. It's, it's um, We hope it's quite a moving sort of... A very depressing place to leave the, the series and make people glad that it's over. I think it's very very sensible. To, but it does have a certain logic, doesn't it, that you didn't want Steve Bradbury to come first, and yet he did anyway. <laughs> yeah, he pulled a Bradbury even in our episode order. You're right. That's brilliant, Tommy. I hadn't thought of that. Extraordinary. All, all five of the other episodes fell over <laughs> and let <laughs> Bradbury come time. first. <laughs> hey, more with Andrew Hansen in just a moment. The Chaser Report. Now with Extra Whispers. Now, you've got some more audio, um, and I'm, I'm really keen to hear more after that uh, that clip. Which bits have you been authorised to sample for us? Have we got any of, uh, of Mr Bradbury? Yeah, if you want to hear a bit of uh, Stephen Bradbury, what, what surprised us was, you know, we all kind of know the story of how, sure, he won the Olympic gold because everyone else fell over. But the story of what his life was, even to get onto the ice, he had hmm. the most incredible sort of blood-soaked, difficult journey full of, you know, horrible accidents and disasters. We just couldn't believe his actual story. It's quite astonishing. So he goes through hell, and uh, when he finally gets his gold medal, uh, well, this is a little bit of Australian epic from from that moment. Have a listen to this. I skate, go clean through my right leg and almost died. I broke my neck. I was lucky not to wind up in a wheelchair. But now here I am. It's taken four Olympics, but this time I've really won. And all my bad luck demons have been finally outrun. I've conquered Salt Lake City without becoming a Mormon. I think we need a name for what it is that I've just done. And of course we know the name. It's doing a Bradbury, isn't it? And so that, that, that song then turns into the final song, which is... Called doing so I, I um f- for many years when I used to do the quiz on on radio, uh, whenever anyone won, you know, came in at the last minute, just answered one question and, and got the got the prize. That was doing a Bradbury, and then one night we got him on, and oh, I did had you the get same Bradbury experience. On the quiz? Yeah, I had the same <laughs> experience. 
his because uh, without going into any uh, spoiling any of the details, it is extraordinary. I mean, my stomach turned interviewing the guy about all the stuff that had happened to him, and so the notion that he didn't really deserve the gold medal and just sort of fluked it. I mean, if it, if it was in terms of suffering, he probably deserves deserves twenty or thirty. The guy is essentially a martyr, almost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as that you was say. one of the great things about the story, and that's that's how our story starts. Is you know we say to, to call him lucky is only half true. A lot of people think, oh, he just fluked it, but actually he went, he went through the most extraordinary stuff to to get there. I can't believe you had him on the quiz, Dommy. Did he win? Did he was he good at the quiz? Uh well, he didn't look like he was going to, but of course at the, at the very oh, of course. no, we we got him on I think right afterwards, and it was, it was a very popular interview because by, by that stage I think it had been mentioned every night for several years, so um, it just made a degree of sense. And he was the nicest man too. I just I never quite got the sense why anybody in their right mind would want to become an Olympic sp- uh, speed skater. It sounds awful in so many oh, ways, doesn't but it? but yeah. he was very sweet and and um, full of irony about himself. Which uh, let's just say that um, people who you know do pro athlete athletics and stuff they don't always have a sense of the irony of their own existence. But he certainly did. No, no, he must have done a lot of self reflection after <laughs> becoming so famous well, for well, winning a race in such a weird. On- all those occasions. Such an odd way to win. Well, I never met him. I, I was worried because I play him in the show. I didn't want to meet him. So Chris oh, interviewed okay. Stephen Bradbury and I still haven't met him. I want to wait and, you know, well, see what he thinks of the show because he hasn't actually watched it yet. He'll, he has to wait till it oh, comes okay. on, until it actually comes out. If you win awards for this, and I, I hope you you do, Bloody if you win so. the Logie or something. Or an Olympic gold medal. Maybe. What, what needs to happen is you need to be just up there poised to give the speech and then Bradbury just rushes to the podium and just gets in <laughs> yeah. front of both. Both of you. Yes, yes, we we fall over, <laughs> crashing into I think each that's other. That's what you should do. Well, on our mark, way to the mic. <laughs> mark it here. That's what you should do on the night. You know what? That, that's a very funny. You idea. should actually yeah. do that. Mm. We should book him in if just in case. You're on, Dommy. I love that idea. So I'm, I'm sorry you didn't manage to make an episode about um about the big drama in the history of the Chaser. That would have been a wonderful chance oh, for self reflection. Oh, look, it was it'd be too sad. I, feel, I, feel, <laughs> yeah. I think we've got a, one more clip, do we? Yeah. Do you want me to bang out? Yeah, we can. We can have a let's go out on a listen high. to another little tuner. So this is the uh, the moment when Australians were getting ready for Johnny Depp and his dogs, Pistol and Boo, to arrive on the Gold Coast to film a new Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Here we've got our fantastic ensemble cast singing a number about the the excitement that's building up on the Gold Coast. Goes like this. The whispers, have you heard the news? A private jet has just touched down and wait till we tell you who's. The Gold Coast has gone giddy, silly grin from ear to ear. No one's lost their shit like this since we filmed Big Brother here. But this is even bigger, a high so high we won't come down. Cause Aussies feel much better, so, so, so much better. When an American's in town. And that's the uh, that's the take uh, takeaway message. That first song, and Americans in town. It's a, and the whole story is really about you know, our funny sort of paradoxical relationship that we have with Hollywood celebrities. We love them, we adore them, we look up to them. We're so excited if they notice us for five minutes, but at the same time, we we, we hate them. We we don't like it if they think they're better than us. I can just hear the two of you making a serious pitch to television executives about the profound reflections on Australian culture on offer and the deep <laughs> insights into the true stories and the the journalism that's being brought to the table as a pre- text to spend years making your silly songs. I'm so glad you got to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, we had to at least pretend to the ABC that there was some deeper engine to all of this. But yeah, it was really just fun just running around and singing a lot. Boy, it was cold though. Every time I look at the clips in the show, I just feel freezing because the whole <laughs> thing was shot in Melbourne well, that's uh, towards first winter. You know, it's kind of I like, can't even do a Ferris wheel in that city, I hear. <laughs> yeah, well, the Ferris wheel too. And we had to pretend, you, you had to because we didn't have the budget to travel. And so for the Chappelle Corby story, we somehow had to make somewhere in Melbourne in, in winter look the same as Bali, <laughs> as a Bali holiday <laughs> resort. Max Miller, our director, did a great job. We had any, actually we had a genius location scouts as well who, who found the, these little places in Melbourne where you could fake it to look like the Gold Coast or Bali. And Max Miller, who directed all of Auntie Donna's screen stuff, he, he directed Australian Epic and... 
you know, we, we really wanted somebody like that who had a really good comic sensibility, a lot of, you know, he's directed things that are really fun and silly, but he was also able to, you know, fake things on a very low budget to make them look like an MGM musical that was shot on location, even though it was actually knocked out in Melbourne during the middle of COVID lockdown. I'm sure that there's, isn't there a small bar somewhere that's decorated exactly like Karabakan Prison? Yeah. <laughs> oh, of course there is. We've got that here in, in <laughs> Melbourne. It's just near the... Um, the satanic vegan bar. <laughs> in, in, I, I kid you not, there is one. <laughs> is that a Salman I don't know if it's pun? still open, but it was in Footscray anyway. They make great uh, satanic croissants there, apparently. <laughs> oh, delicious. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. Great blood sacrifices, but no blood mm. involved. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, um, I must say it's brilliant having the kind of proper showbiz singers. I mean, as, as wonderful as you are, Andrew, and I'm sure as extraordinary as Chris's singing is going to prove to be, just having that that kind of full trained ability to kind of belt those notes just adds so much to the kind of um, satirical nature of it all. Yeah, it does. It makes it sort of funny. You're right, Dommy. It, it makes it kind of funnier <clears throat> in a way if you've got a really good singer, you know, like Phoenix Mendoza or, you know, Amy La Palma, these beautiful music theatre vocals in the, in the silliest situations as well. So when you've got Amy La Palma singing about very small Australian things like Koshy or John Fane's Melbourne radio show and she's singing about it in this Broadway voice. Uh, it's really it's really very funny, yeah. Better than getting comedians to do it who can't sing well, like Chris and me perhaps. <laughs> nah, <laughs> Even no, though we true. are in it. That's not true of you. Regardless. I'll go as far as that. You're a wonderful singer, oh, but yeah. I can build it a few notes. I'm looking I mean, Chris forward to is fine because he Taylor. plays the drill sergeant and he also plays a, a, a sailor, an old sea dog in a sea shanty. Mind you, the, the, there is a... I can give you a bit of inside info. If you watch the sea shanty number in the Tampa episode where Chris and Nicholas Kong and I play the, the three sailors on board the Tampa, we've got the, the three of us singing at once, but but Chris, that's not his voice. I've actually sung Chris's part. So it's got... <laughs> It's got two Andrews and a Nicholas <laughs> Kong. That reminds singing. me of all the chaser, all the chaser musical numbers where um, it's just you multi-tracked. And the, guy, oh, yeah, the guys yeah, are vibing. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Great. Well, congratulations yeah, but it is on Chris getting it the, Chris is the soldier. Chris sings his own drill sergeant. Pick. Okay, all right. Well, we'll keep an eye out for that one. And maybe use Peter Jackson's technology to isolate the vocals <laughs> and have some fun with that. I've tried so hard to put John Lennon's vocals into this show. <laughs> I couldn't work out how to separate the damn things with the with the ABC's editing software. Well, congrats on getting it up. So that's nine p.m. when. Wednesdays for the next six weeks and on iview now where you can binge Chappelle first the way it was meant to be yeah that's right yeah on iview it um yeah drops same time as as episode one so yeah 9 p.m wednesday and uh and and you can check out the um the soundtrack album which i must say has a nicer mix of the Ooh. music than the okay. tv version because for some reason with tv there's this sort of rule that you have to mix the music for people who own a state of the art sound system in their house and for everybody else it sounds a bit a bit not so good that's how all oh, tv shows are, are okay. made i discovered <laughs> <laughs> on the soundtrack album, yeah, it's an even better mix. And it was mixed by Dave Manton, who normally does Live at the Wireless for Triple J. And pretty much most bands who record at Triple J, Dave Manton does it. And, and Dommy, you and I, you know, we worked with Greg Wales at Triple J years ago. Oh, that was on wonderful. The Blow Parade. Yeah, yeah. So Dave brilliant. Manton is kind of the, he's the, the Melbourne version of Greg Wales. Yeah, he produced it really nicely. I'm glad we've ended on reference to our, our most successful piece of work ever, The Blow Parade. The um, Blow Parade. <laughs> had, had to be One an aria, which I've put on my yeah. CV even though I didn't write any of it. <laughs> it did, but no, look, I, actually, speaking of the aria... I've got oh, it here. it's right there. I keep it because bez- bez- I'm... A, there, there it is. I might get another one of these. There's Who an knows? actual aria. That's fantastic. All right, well, well, well done. Trolly good. ever manufactured. And uh, I guess we'll look for Series 2 in about five years. Well, I think it'll be a limited release. I think I think it'll be special. I think it's just going to be once, this show. Probably because it had so many bureaucratic problems. That, 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 that nobody <laughs> wants to touch it again. <laughs> no, it'll explode. Everyone in Australia will watch it and people will demand, will take to the streets to demand a second series. <laughs> That's what I'm predicting. Yeah, yeah it'll be Huge like in Les Mis. Do you hear the it'll people be- <laughs> sing? <laughs> <laughs> get your well, banners got, out. Get your it's Australian got Barnaby Joyce banners. in it. Gina Reinhardt will probably cough up for series two if you get put another Barnaby Joyce story in there. I mean, his his marriage would be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a 
in a very late night time slot, maybe. That was great, Andrew. Uh, good luck. I hope. I, I, the... I, I hope. I hope that's made you r- vaguely interested in tuning into the bloody thing. Otherwise, I've wasted my time here. Yeah. Well, no, I'm going to watch gonna... it, but I'm, I'm I'm very happy for you. I'm going to watch it on <laughs> iView. I'm not going to tune in. No one tunes in anymore. Nobody tunes. Yeah. In. No, no, no. But I've downstream not dream away. You're, you're asleep by then. But uh, so yeah, iView's the way. I'm definitely going to open Deezer and listen to the soundtrack right now. <laughs> Check it out on Deezer. Let you go. that Deezer into your ears, Deezer. let me tell you. Don't Spotify right. it, Deezer it. <laughs> our gear is from Road, we're part of the Iconoclast Network, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Tommy. See ya. Bye.